Here's Edward Norton in his latest production, breaking away from the script, breaking down on stage, and insulting everyone around him. This is not documentary footage we're watching. It's a scene from Birdman, or The Incredible Virtue of Ignorance. Edward Norton is deep into his role as Mike Shiner. Yes! Yes! A stage actor. The scenes may be fictional, but does the script and character draw from real life experiences? Well, some people from the Incredible Hulk production may think so. A whirlwind of rumours, stories and angles from both sides tells the dramatic tale of Edward Norton's one and done role as Bruce Banner for the MCU. But what exactly happened? And why was the behind the scenes drama between Norton and Marvel more intriguing than the Incredible Hulk versus the Abomination? Learn the true story. Hear both sides. Dive into Norton's movie production history and see how not only is the MCU 10 years strong, but so is the feud that never seems to die down. <laughs> 2008 was a huge year for Marvel. Not quite sure what they had on the table, Marvel Studios was gathering together some of their biggest properties and trying something pretty unprecedented, building a large-scale connected universe. I'm here to talk to you about the Avenger Initiative. This universe would be larger than Universal Monsters, bigger than Freddy vs. Jason, and help revitalize the company after selling off so many of their big screen properties over the years. The two movies looking to make the first step towards the MCU, Iron Man and The Incredible Hulk. Despite an all-star cast in the Iron Man movie, the film was more of a gamble with a lesser known character. The Incredible Hulk was supposed to be a surefire hit, providing action sequences, a big green guy, and its own A-list cast of stars like Edward Norton and Liv Taylor. At the end of 2008, one thing was clear. Iron Man was a massive hit, raking in over $300 million domestically. And The Incredible Hulk barely broke even with $134 million. And to this day, The Incredible Hulk still sits at the bottom of the MCU totem pole, with next closest being Captain America, the first Avenger at $176 million. So what exactly went wrong with The Incredible Hulk? The script? The casting? The effect? Something clearly went wrong behind the scenes, and over the years, many details have been revealed, and many signs point to trouble with lead actor Edward Norton. Edward Norton is not the most obvious choice for a lead role in a superhero movie. This is a guy who typically avoids the fluff movies, often leading to more artistic endeavors like Primal Fear, American History X, Rounders, and Fight Club. He didn't become an actor to win box office gold. He wants acclaim for his on-screen presence and his ability to transform into a character. And even if The Incredible Hulk was a pure popcorn thrill ride, Norton took the role of Bruce Banner as serious as any other role. He had the duty of filling in for Eric Banner, the star of the 2003 Hulk movie. Instead of going with a straight up sequel or reboot, the Hulk was already entertaining confusing territory. The movie did not ignore the events of the 2003 film, but only slightly alluded to them and avoided any type of origin story. It really fits into its own category as a retooled sequel. Everyone was recast from 2003's Hulk, but the character arcs felt the same, and the South American connection between the end of Hulk and the beginning of The Incredible Hulk helped create a natural progression between the films. And despite some similarities between the movies, Edward Norton's casting was clearly going to bring on a different Bruce Banner. This Bruce Banner had more emotional depth, struggled with the monster inside him, and a desperation to be free of the Green Beast. The screenplay for The Incredible Hulk was written by Zack Penn, known for other Marvel movies like X-Men, The Last Stand, Elektra, and X2. As Norton got into the role and analysed the script, he wanted to push Penn's story further, dive deep in the psyche of Bruce Banner, and bring out the elements that drew him to the role. In normal circumstances, the character building would be done between the director, screenwriter, and actor, creating connections and building upon scenes. Norton took a different approach. Two months before filming began, Norton was busy reworking and rewriting The Incredible Hulk script. Of course, the actor was pretty limited considering that sets were being built, the cast was locked in, and the special effects team was already planning some of the biggest stunts. This left Norton with some of the more quiet moments, 
character building or dialogue driven scenes he could really chew on as an actor. He wrote an almost complete rewrite on the film, but he wasn't done there. After finishing his draft, the pages were sent to the Incredible Hulk director Louis Leteria. And these were the days before the MCU was on autopilot. In the early stages of the MCU, Edward Norton felt like he had more creative control. And in the end, Marvel Studios made their own power moves, helping to set up their own vision of the future, not one guided by Edward Norton. While filming, everything seemed to go too smooth. Leteria actually shot everything, including the original screenplay pages and the pages that Norton had added to the script. And Norton's process seemed never-ending. In the style of a perfectionist, he was constantly changing scenes, adding dialogue, and trying to make the perfect Bruce Banner. And after production completed, Leteria compiled everything into one massive cut, just to see what he had. A common practice among directors, Leteria's full cut was naturally a mess, but it helped him weed out what works and what doesn't with the film. But Leteria wasn't alone in the process. In another rare move for an actor, Edward Norton actually sat in on the editing process, suggesting scenes, working with Leteria, and envisioning the final product that he helped write. Marvel Studios received the first cut of the film with a runtime of 2 hours and 20 minutes. To the executives, this was far too long for a solo superhero film with an emphasis on fun action. Despite arguments from both Norton and Leteria, the final cut was whittled down to 1 hour and 52 minutes, a far cry from their original version. Assuming he had more creative control, Edward Norton was naturally upset with the process and the finished product. Marvel wasn't budging and there was nothing Norton could do. As for the script, both drafts were sent to the Writers Guild of America for their typical credit arbitration process. The results deemed Norton's contribution not substantial enough, and the final cut and the sole screen credit were awarded to Zack Penn for the movie. And despite this, Edward Norton claimed at a Comic-Con panel for The Incredible Hulk that he wrote the screenplay, completely ignoring Zack Penn's work on the film. Penn took offence to this and publicly talked about how many of the ideas from The Incredible Hulk movie had been something he planned for nearly 16 years. Once press got word of the tension between Marvel and Norton, things are only kicked up a notch between the two. Countless news articles were released, stories of Norton's past came to light, and the whole thing became one of the main focuses leading up to the movie. And for director Leteria, he played the role of the middleman more than the lead director. Nightmares. He placed blame on himself, Marvel and Edward for not coming to agreements, working on different cuts or communicating properly. As word rose about the rift between Norton and Marvel, more and more tension was placed on the film. Norton's act of revenge? A limited press tour. We've seen it for many years now when a new Marvel film is set for release. The lead actors make their rounds, stopping at talk shows, doing guest appearances, conducting all sorts of interviews on forms of media such as radio stations, podcasts and streaming outlets. Norton simply refused. Refused to support the movie that he didn't have his own final say in. Edward Norton did make one significant appearance on Jimmy Kimmel Live. On the show, he stars in a sketch with Kimmel's sidekick and security guard Guillermo, where Guillermo paints his body green and acts like a wimpier version of the real Hulk. Even though it's satire, a few of Norton's lines in the sketch ring true, including his desire to resuscitate the Hulk franchise up from the cellar. We're trying to resuscitate this franchise from the cellar. And the end quote, this is not what I bleeping signed up for. Knowing the history of the production and Norton's vision of the movie, the line in the sketch couldn't ring more true and showcase Norton's feelings. And despite Norton's limited involvement in the publicity of the film, The Incredible Hulk stomped forward and was officially released on June 13, 2008. The final film itself received mixed reviews, totaling a Rotten Tomatoes score of 67%. Only Thor, The Dark World would fall shorter at 66%. Ed Norton is often praised for his performance, but it can only rise so much against the typical plot and repetitive action sequences. How many times do we need to see aimless soldiers pumping bullets into a beast that can't be damaged by them? No matter how Norton or Marvel acted in the situation, one of the biggest questions was whether Norton's content was actually good. Well, fans got to judge for themselves because a majority of the cutscenes were actually released on a special 3-disc edition of The Incredible Hulk, 
one of the cutscenes would actually come to play further down the line in the MCU and be one of the most dramatic scenes in the whole movie. Instead of starting off in Brazil, Norton wrote and filmed a scene set in the Antarctic. Travelling through the snowy glaciers alone and isolated, Bruce Banner's soul had seen enough of the destruction that he caused, including a quick flashback of a reshot lab scene from 2003's Hulk. He decides to put a bullet in his mouth, but the Hulk intervenes even before the trigger is pulled. In a rage, the Hulk smashes the glacier, caused an avalanche, and Bruce Banner must live on another day with the big green beast still inside him. The scene is crucial in several ways. It immediately starts off with Bruce's state of mind. He wants the Hulk gone from him, and no matter what cost. We get to see the Incredible Hulk right away, and the filmmakers included a small easter egg, Captain America's frozen body trapped under the snow. So why did Marvel cut the scene? Well, for a PG-13 film guided towards more family-friendly audiences, a suicide attempt was probably not the best option to open the movie with. And starting the film in Brazil also helped it connect with the 2003 version if Universal ever opted to continue the franchise in this way. Oddly enough, the scene lived on in multiple ways. In The Avengers, Mark Ruffalo's version of the Hulk directly references the cut footage, talking about a time he got low and wanted to end the Hulk. I didn't see an end, so I put a bullet in my mouth and the other guy spit it out. Except, this wasn't the case in Edward Norton's footage. He never got to pull the trigger before the Hulk appeared. The likely reference comes from the strangest of all places, the official Incredible Hulk video game. As with any movies turned into video games, developers begin the game-making process months before the movie's even scheduled for release. Clearly, Norton's script was used as a template for the game, and the very first scene references Hulk spitting out the bullet, just as Ruffalo referenced in The Avengers. But clearly, just having his scenes wasn't enough in the video game for the actor, even if he also provided the character's voiceovers. My name is Bruce Banner. I'm trying to stop a monster. You would think the release of the film would end the drama, but it was only the beginning of a long and tumultuous relationship between Norton and Marvel. It could have gone down as another behind-the-scenes urban legend of sorts, but the feud continued all thanks to the MCU. It turns out that comic book fans were into, really into, the whole idea of the connected universes. Thor, Iron Man 2 and Captain America all hit theatres, building separate worlds and building up to the first culmination in the form of the Avengers. But what's a superhero team without a big green guy leading the charge? The Hulk was a key component of the group, but would Edward Norton be on board to reprise his role? Especially in a film where he would have no creative control? The answer was an obvious no. In a statement in July 2010, two years before the Avengers debuted, Marvel announced the departure of Edward Norton from the role. Some of the key moments from this statement was this line that sounded like a direct dig at Norton. Marvel stated, Our decision is definitely not one based on monetary factors, but instead rooted in the need for an actor who embodies the creativity and the collaborative spirit of our other talented cast members. Clearly upset with Norton's nag for creative control, they pushed him out from the role, but Norton wouldn't stay silent on the subject for too long. His agent was the first to respond and didn't seem to hold anything back by stating, This offensive statement by Kevin Feiger at Marvel is a purposely misleading, inappropriate attempt to paint our client in a negative light. He would go on to talk about positive meetings between Norton and Avengers director Joss Whedon until Marvel suddenly called and decided to go in a different direction. Norton used Facebook for his own response and kept things pretty diplomatic and didn't cast blame on either side. With information available to the public and Marvel quickly snapping up Mark Ruffalo for the role, Thanks. whose side would fans take? Separate from the Incredible Hulk incident, neither Norton or Marvel has much of a clean slate when it comes to behind-the-scenes controversy. Over the years, Norton has built up the reputation of being a tough actor to work with. The first incident was another movie where Norton insisted on taking control in the editing room. American History X is considered a dramatic masterpiece and one of Norton's best efforts, and he had a heavy hand with the final edit of the film. Norton took so much control of the final movie that director Tony Kaye petitioned to have him removed from the credits. Much like Marvel, Kay wanted a more shorter and trimmed film. Unlike Marvel, New Line Cinema sided with Norton 
pushing Kay out and allowing Norton's two-hour cut to prevail over the much shorter movie that Kay had envisioned, Kay's distaste for the movie and Norton's changes led to the director publicly lashing out at the actor, even going so far as to refer to him as a narcissistic dilettante. In the 2002 dark comedy Death to Smoochie, Norton denied many of the costume designer's options for his character. As an alternative, he ordered a custom Amani suit and used it for his character in the movie. Also in 2002, Norton has a small appearance in the bio-flick Frida. Dating star Selma Hayek at the time, Norton took a similar role as he did with The Incredible Hulk, creating a whole new draft of the screenplay and using it for the production. Once again, Norton was not given a screenplay credit, but he still claims that his draft for the script was the one filmed for the movie. And the stories only continue. Paramount took a chance on Norton early in his career by casting him in Primal Fear. As part of the contract, Norton was obligated to do two more films, but he put them off for several years. This is when Paramount forced Norton to take a role in the action film The Italian Job. Norton wasn't too happy being forced into a role he never wanted, but at least kept his anger quiet on set and didn't cause too many problems. But because of this, Norton has never worked with Paramount again, and probably won't work with them in the future. Other rambling and unconfirmed stories have come out about Norton over the years, but on the other side of things, Norton has been praised by many directors, actors, and film producers. And this leads us back to Birdman. The role seemed to be written for Norton, Catering towards his intense work ethic and his reputation for being known as a perfectionist, Norton has seemed to accept this version of himself and gives in to the artistic of making films. On the other side of the coin, Marvel has been known to hulk out and take charge over the years, so there's not one guilty party here, but a mix of emotions and clashing creative forces who probably should have never collaborated in the first place. As the years have gone by, the stories behind Norton's Marvel departure have only changed, even from the words of the actor himself. In recent years, Norton claims that as an actor, he was always looking for new and different projects to broaden his horizons. Basically, he's not interested in doing any sequels. It rings true if you look at his whole film career. No Fight Club 2, no American History X 2. He didn't team up with Matt Damon for another round of rounders. The closest thing to reprising a role was two appearances on The Simpsons, one in 2000 and another in 2013, each time voicing a different character. His Hulk-like anger only seems to be directed at Marvel and the whole post-production process. He looks back fondly on the movie, including his relationship with the director. And the award-winning actor just can't seem to let go of the big green guy. For some reason, the mediocre superhero film gets brought up by Norton. Whether he's doing the talking or a Hollywood journalist is asking the questions, just last year at the Comedy Central roast of Bruce Willis, Edward Norton found time to roast Marvel and the Incredible Hulk. In multiple digs about the movie, Norton makes fun of the script, claiming he just wanted it to be good. And he says he wanted to be in a movie just as good as Christopher Nolan's weakest film. These disses only brought the Norton and Marvel feud back into the spotlight, but it's like Marvel didn't even blink. 2019 is a far cry from the 2008 Marvel. Back then, they were still planning the bigger picture and setting things into motion. Now we have an MCU that churns like a well-oiled machine. Mark Ruffalo played the Hulk in every Avengers film and a lengthy appearance in Thor Ragnarok. The recasting of Mark Ruffalo also feels like a dig at Norton because the two are friends in real life. Ruffalo asked Norton if it was okay that he took on the role and Norton gave him the go-ahead with no hard feelings. He didn't pass on any advice though and kind of just let Ruffalo do his own thing as he transformed into the hero. Even if Edward Norton did sign up for the Avengers, the actor probably wouldn't have continued the franchise and stayed on board for all of these years. Norton goes on his own trail, sets his own path, and clearly, mainstream blockbuster films are not what he's drawn to. As the MCU moves on, any castings or shake-ups will likely bring the Norton recasting back into the spotlight. As the news becomes fresh again and fans look for any new details in the dispute between the two parties, Edward Norton and Marvel were just not a perfect match in Hollywood. A story that happens often, but this one had a big green spotlight shining on it and creating enough compelling drama for everyone to enjoy. Well, now we need to know, whose side are you on? We didn't skew things to one party or the other too much, right? Just presenting the facts as we know them. 
You want to see more docs like this? Leave us a comment, give us a shout out and share it with your friends.